Hello and welcome to Pro Wrestling 101. I am your host, JP John Paz. With me today is a very, very special guest. He's the man behind the Russo brand. He is a former WCW World Heavyweight Champion. He is Mr. Vince Russo. Vince, what's going on? Welcome back. You got back. that right, John. Let me give you some applause for getting that right. Hold on, John. Hold on. <laughs> what is going on, John? How are you? John, I finally, through DM... I finally got to connect with Dutch a couple of weeks ago. It was oh, really, right. really great uh, exchanging DMs with him. I got to get him on the phone. I want to talk to Dutch. Yes. he uh, He's a little upset about Clemson football. They stink. So, uh, oh, yeah, he was. Yeah. a. You, I, I remember that about him. You Every time I hear Clemson, I think of Dutch. So as far as today, definitely want to talk about writing and stuff. But what's going on with the brand? And is everything back to? Uh... Yeah, no, we're back, bro. Uh, finally, I, I was without a platform for about four months, bro. We didn't have an RSS feed. We were emailing people their shows. Uh, you know, we, we, we but I don't know if you know this or not, but we were getting hacked. Whereas when subscribers were paying us, it was the money was being intercepted and funneled into an account in China. Whoa. Yes. A a all of it. All of it, bro. So obviously, bro, we had to rebuild a brand new site from scratch, like no plugins. Like this is a unique site, uh, knowing how big we wanted to make channel attitude. So we're finally up and running. Uh, everybody can, you know, subscribe back. You can go to russosbrand.com or you can go to channelattitude.com either way. But yes, uh, finally, we are back in business. We're creating new shows like you always are. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more content now, bro. Very interested in Vince versus Vince and yes. uh, breaking down the Attitude Era. Those are two good ones I like. Yes. Yeah. I, I did the first episode of Attitude Era. I really enjoyed it. I think I'm going to record the first episode of Vince versus Vince today. And, uh, I mean, I'm really going to lay out, lay out that entire story. Yeah, that's cool because, uh, you know, you're breaking down some walls. Maybe we've heard the story, but we're going to hear obviously a lot more of the story, right? Yeah, well, there was a last email exchange, uh, you know, which to me was the period at the end of the sentence. And, and I'm going to share that. And you know what? There may be some people that are pro this, Vince. There may be some people that are pro that, Vince. But for me, bro, it's it's closure and I need to get it out there and I need to tell the story. So I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do it over several installments on that's going to be on Patreon, bro. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Russo TWC. I wonder what's going on with him. I'm hearing stories. He doesn't want to do this anymore. He doesn't want to do that anymore. He's cutting this off, he's cutting that off. I wonder really what's going on. Sometimes he's not going to meetings. I wonder what's going on. With I him. don't know what's like going him. on there, bro. Between, you know, Hunter and, you know, supposedly Shane left for good again. And like I said, bro, my, I had a little insight because of my exchange with him and it was it was really eye opening for me but to me it it kind of answers a lot of problems uh that seem to be going on right there now so it'll be interesting Really, I mean, Shane is gone, obviously. Stephanie has a different role. Triple H had a heart attack, and then all of his guys get fired. So it, <laughs> it's a little bit weird what's going on. And then, obviously, lost to AEW in the, the NXT thing. So yeah. I mean, Vince is not happy with a bunch of the guys, I guess. Yeah, but, bro, but uh, like I said, uh, I, I think my exchange with him is going to make people, a lot of people say WTF, bro. Right. Yeah. I love it. So today, I wanted to focus in on the last time we were, we were on Pro Wrestling 101, we were talking about WBF and the writing. I wanted to focus in on WCW. So when you go to WCW, obviously, big contract, big deal. You move down to Atlanta. What is the structure like? Is it you and Ed, or is it a committee? Like, who's writing? No, show? it's it, it it started with me and Ed. I mean, that that was the deal. You know, me, me and Ed were being hired to do what we did at WWE. So it it, it was me and Ed. I mean, that, that was the plan. We had a game plan. We knew exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, the first three months in, we were seeing that plan through. We were doing exactly what we said we were going to do. Um, when we took over, bro, the last show, I'll never forget it, bro. It's when they did three segments with Bret Hart and Benoit. That last show did a 2.5 rating. In three months, when Ed and I did the next three months, and keep in mind, it was three-hour shows back then. 
when we did the next three months, we got it up to a 3.5 in those three months. And what the game plan was, was we had to, you know, demolish the building that was already in place. And we had to brick by brick start building our our foundation. And that that's exactly what we were doing, bro, the first three months there. And like I said, listen, the, the ratings are out there for anybody to look at. Uh, and and if you if you call it a failure going from 2.5 to 3.5 in three months, I really want to understand what your definition of failure is. I mean, those numbers are out there. Anybody can look up the numbers. We we were well on our way to delivering exactly what we promised them. Now, when you're writing, like when you first get WCW, I used to have an old boss, and he used to put everybody's name on this big board and like where he wanted them, where they where he wanted them to be. And like, you know, he had everybody. Is that like when you're a writer, you first get WCW, you're like, okay, see Brett and all these names. Do you have like a board of you have every guy listed where you want them uh, to be? No, where no, going, no, not really, bro. We probably have in front of us just the roster. <laughs> you know, we probably yeah. have the paper in front of us. And you know, bro, we're we're literally going through the roster and making sure somehow, some way as many people are involved as possible. Bro, a tricky thing at the beginning too that a lot of people don't realize is when we first took over, bro, they were right back in, they were in the middle of the ready to rumble filling of, of filming. So off the bat, bro, there were a lot of guys I couldn't put on the show. Like, you know, you know the page and, you know, every, every week, different guys from the roster were filming that movie. So that, that was something that we had to deal with right off the bat. That was a little difficult. Interesting. Uh, with that, I never really realized that for, cause yep. obviously it comes out in 2000, but obviously they got a film in 99. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So you and Ed, is it again, total collaboration between you two, they, yep. I mean, there's no one A, one B. I mean, there's you guys are working together. You know. Absolutely, one hundred percent. We were doing the same thing we were doing at the WWE at the beginning, exactly the same. What do you take of Ed and the move? Like, was he totally for it? Did he want to leave with you? Because obviously, you have your own separate story about leaving with Vince and him telling yeah, you that he, he would have. Ne- Bro, the funny thing was, I went down there on my own. Um, and uh, when I went down there, it was a it was a Saturday. Um, they interviewed me on a Saturday, and I brought up the idea of bringing Ed aboard. And they, I called Ed that night, and uh, Ed was very, very interested. Bro, Ed did not get along with Vince. And, and I'll go as far as to say, I don't want to use the word hated, but Ed did not like Vince. Um, 10 times. Well, like, bro, I, I never disliked Vince or hated Vince. Like I could tolerate Vince. Ed could not tolerate Vince. So when I called Ed and said, bro, listen, I'm going to WCW. They want you to fly down tomorrow. He was 100% in bro. I don't think for a second, Ed would have stayed on at WWE as a writer if I had left because bro there were a couple of times when Ed was ready to leave and the only time I got him to stay was because I went to Vince and got Ed more money so I I don't I don't think Ed would have stayed there by himself at the WWE at all you know he's got his story but obviously yours he told you to get a nanny and basically they were going to give you a smackdown, right? And it's like, oh, Vince, what, like, what the hell's going on here? Like, you didn't even yeah. tell us. Yeah. He just expects you to work, 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 and not even. It, think it, it was life. more the nanny line than anything, you know. And it and it wasn't like John. It wasn't the amount of work. It was the pride that Ed and I put into Raw. We, I mean, we put our blood, sweat, and tears into Raw. And now you're adding another show, and now it's like we we realize this is not going to be our best work. I, I mean, having to write two shows, you're not going to get the type of quality you got with Raw because ne- we had put so much time into Raw, 
And now we were going to have to like, bro, our shows, re the quality of our shows really meant a lot to us. And we knew we were going to lose some of that quality if you added another show. And that that really bothered us at the time. It was it, it wasn't a workload, bro. It was it was that it was we were afraid that we weren't going to be able to put out the best shows with, you know, f four hours now, whatever the hell it was. But I mean, the 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 nail in the coffin was the nanny line without a shadow of a doubt. So who hired you to WWE? Is it Bill Bush? Is it Brad Siegel? Who's the one that actually hires you? Bill Bush and Brad Siegel were um, present at all the meetings. So at the end of the day, bro, it would have been Brad Siegel that hired me, but I worked directly with Bill Bush. Brad Siegel, just tell me a little bit about him, because to me, he's a, like a, somewhat of a strange character in the business that he won't talk really wrestling. I've talked to him before, and this is so funny. I had a quote unquote interview with him, not interview, like I wanted to interview him. He said I could not be recording. So I'm like, okay. So I didn't record it, obviously. But he went on for like 15, 20 minutes. But then he's like, I don't really, really want to talk wrestling anymore, blah, blah, blah. So it seems like he's not a wrestling guy. Not at all, bro. As yeah. a matter of fact, after 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 uh, TNT, he went on and actually opened up a gospel station, bro. Because I actually had a couple of meetings with him and like trying to do something with him. Absolutely not a, not a wrestling fan, bro. He was a TV network executive guy not a wrestling fan at all he did not want to talk about scott hall either <laughs> oh really i could have well i could have right, dated his niece right or, or yes, whatever yes, exactly yes yes but it was just one of those things where it's like wow brad siegel seems like he's almost like anti-wrestling yeah anti the business like yeah. total corporate guy yeah bro i'm sure all that too left a bad taste in his mouth i mean i'm really sure it did but no not a wrestling guy at all bro at all because I remember reading old interviews with him. He talked about like when football was on the station. He'd really yeah. pump up. We have football. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, oh, and he's like, oh, and we have wrestling. It's a high, yeah. Yeah, high no. show. Like he would always pump up. What it, We got tennis. We got like He'd pump yeah. up other stuff. Yeah. Total TNT corporate guy, not a wrestling guy at all. Absolutely not. Yeah. What about Bill Bush? Uh, not at all. He, bro, he was an accountant, you know, so uh, not a wrestling guy. Absolutely not a wrestling guy. So when you, let's say you, Ed, write the show and you put it together, does Bill Bush or Siegel or somebody have to look, you know, like Vince McMahon would look at the final show and be like, yep, check it off. It's great. No. It's just you guys and you guys are in charge. Yes. Yep. 100%. Yeah. What position do they call you guys? Like what? what's the title? God, I don't I don't know, bro. I'm not even sure what was on my contract, but it, it wasn't more than head writer. I, you know, bro, that's why a lot of people think like I ran W. No, bro, I wrote the show. I mean, that's all I did. I did the same thing at WW, WWE that I did at WCW. We wrote the show. I wasn't involved in the hiring and firing. I had nothing to do with any of that. Ed and myself, we wrote the show. That's what we did. So I always try to ask Kevin Sullivan, hey, what did Piper get? How much money? He's like, I'm not in charge of WCW. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. Like, I don't know how much money Piper yeah, made. Yeah, people think we know that. Bro, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue of contracts, what people are getting paid. I don't have a clue. So when you go in and you're first there, what's the like the temperature like? Is They always said WCW is a political cesspool. Oh, forget, it, forget it, bro. Forget it. Forget it. I mean, the, the, the day... The day I walked in the building, I knew, like, this is bad. Um, you know, the first thing I noticed, bro, was you had you had a clear-cut split in the locker room. You had all the, 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 the main event money guys stayed here, and everybody else stayed there. It was almost like a two-class system, bro. You, you noticed that and saw that without a shadow of a doubt. And I was getting kind of cross looks from the veteran side of it because I guess I had a reputation of, you know, helping the younger guys and the underneath guys. I, I mean, bro, I can remember like, you know, Hulk just kind of gazing at me, like just glaring a whole I can remember that you know bro wasn't so much with like the hall and the Nashes because they worked with me a little bit especially Kevin Kevin knew me 
But I'm talking about, bro, working with Hogan for the first time and working with Flair for the first time. I knew, bro, these guys did not trust me no matter what I did or what I said. Um, you know, bro, this is where the paranoia of the wrestler comes into play. The, all they're concerned about is not losing their spots. And in their mind, Vince Russo is the guy that is coming in. I'm going to promote the young guys, and they're going to lose. Bro, I, I, I knew all this was happening. I knew all this was happening, bro, but I had a job to do. And Ed and I had a plan and I was committed to the plan and I was committed to the company. Bro, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that as I start building the, the, the younger guys, the group in the middle, the, the, the uh, Guerreras and the Benoits and those guys, bro, I knew the Hogans and the Flares were going to run to management. Guys like Bill Bush did not have a clue as to what was going on. So he was going to be worked very easily, bro. I knew it. Like I, I'm, I'm not an idiot. I'm from, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, bro. I knew what was going on, but I knew I had a job to do. And I was committed to that job, even though I knew, bro, seeing that vision and that plan through, was probably going to cost me my job. I knew that, but it's what WCW desperately needed to do at the time. So Hulkster obviously will kind of almost not work his way out, but I mean, he kind of fades out a little bit. He loses to to Sting and he, you know, he just walks out. Flair gets buried in, in the desert. And he always says, he's like, oh, that's symbolism. Was it symbolism? Bro, the whole idea was, and that is absolute bullshit. 1,000% bullshit. Bro, I had an incentive clause in my contract. The higher the rating, the more money I made, okay? Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair are draws. They are icons, bro. I would be an absolute ass to write them off the shows. Now, before I got there, these guys were still wrestling and were just wrestlers on the roster, no, bro. They had to be moved into a, a role that was more suited for them at where they were in their career. But for, for the, the idea of me writing them off the show, absolute bullshit. Bro, the idea was, and if you saw what we did, it would be as clear as day. Bro, We the idea was to get rid of the legends one by one. Okay? And if you notice, bro... Hogan, Flair, we did it with Piper. We did it with Henning. If Henning loses one more match, he's out. Yep. We did it with Duggan. D Duggan was, we, we, we were demoralizing the legends, and one by one they were disappearing. Piper, Savage, one by one they were disappearing. Bro, the game plan was these guys were going to come back united like the Avengers, but this is way before there was the Avengers franchise in the movie, but they were going to come back united. Henning, Flair, Hogan, Savage, Piper, Henning, Duggan, they were going to come back united because, bro, the beauty of that story was these guys were fighting for their jobs against management but how were all these personalities going to get along? How was Piper going to get along with Hogan? How was Hogan going to get along with Flair? How was Savage going to get along? That was the dynamic and the story. And they were all told that, bro. They were all told that. That's why Flair was buried in a desert. That's why, you know, we did the lay down with Hogan. That's why if Henning lost the match, he was out. That's why when Savage came out, the first promo he cut was directed to me. That's why Jim Duggan was made to be my janitor. That was the game plan. But these guys were so paranoid that I was writing them off TV that they got in Bill Bush's ear. 
They work Bill Bush. He don't know what's going on. And, bro, you got to understand, I knew all this. None of this came as a surprise to me. So they got to Bush. They got in his ear. And that's when I was called in. And Bill Bush, literally white as a ghost, uh, tells me, you know, Vince, we're taking a change in direction, which told me he didn't believe in it because the ratings were going up, bro. Like, cause I remember, I, I, cause I remember saying, I, right, let me get this straight, bro. We've gone from a two, five to a three, five in three months. And you're making a change in direction. Like that's, that's very odd to me, Bill. Like white is a ghost. Like couldn't even answer me, which told me he, he was worked, you know, by, by wrestling and I just sat there, bro, very calmly because I saw it coming. And I just said, you know what, Bill? That's not what my contract states. My contract states I am the head of creative. I have no interest in being part of your committee. I said, so I'm going to go home, um, you know, tell uh, Brad to get a hold of me. Let, let me, let, let me know how we're going, how he's going to pay out my contract. And I'll just go on my way because I, I I I saw it all happening, bro, in those first three months. So the politics, they're not going to let it play out. Right. Like literally the powers that be you, you're Vince, you know, behind right. the scenes. But you're on your voice is on camera. Right. J.R. is Ed, Oklahoma. Right. Gerald and Pat, Pat Brisco or uh, uh, Pat Patterson, Jerry Briscoe, obviously right. the Harris twins. Right. Shane is Virgil. Right. I mean, you guys said all the, the funny like. Know, poke fun guys in place but backstage it was very much the guys were actually kind of taking everything one so serious. paranoid yeah. bro yeah. so freaking paranoid i mean it oh yeah bro like and like i said man you, you gotta understand bro I, i'm a normal guy i i i worked jobs before this i had my own businesses i i was never in the wrestling bubble so like when when you're kind of on the outside looking in on all this, bro, you, you tend to be smarter than everybody else because they, they think they're so smart and they think they're so brilliant. You know what, bro? In that world, they might be. But the outside world, bro, that has lived outside of the wrestling bubble, bro, you, you see right through this shit. So, you know, like I said, bro, my, my first three months with Ed, we were doing our job. We were getting results, but I knew I knew what was going on. It's funny. Disco, the, the puppet over your right shoulder, has come to bat for you when people are like, oh, Vince Russo is very disorganized, blah, blah. He was saying you were the only organized guy there for years because you would do production meetings. You would put, get the scripts. I mean, you would get everything together. He said it was very almost overly organized where beforehand he said it was oh yeah much. bro this is a true story i swear to god i'll never forget the first tv we went to i think it was in biloxi i think it, i'm almost positive it wasn't biloxi but i remember showing up to the building no shit and i said what time is a production meeting whether it was to keith um um mitchell, what, mitchell somebody and bro i'll never forget they looked at me and they said what is a production meeting? It, it, it never existed. They they ne never existed. Bro, we we were we were 100 percent in control. We had the script, we had the meet. Like it was no different, bro, than what we were doing at WWE. The only difference is there was no Vince. So that that was big, bro, because Meaning there was no Vince also means there was nobody that had my back. You see, in the WWE, bro, I was so valuable to Vince that if you messed with me, you messed with him. So nobody, nobody screwed with me, bro, politically. So I was able to concentrate just on the show. I did not have that protection here. So I was I was open game, bro, from day one. So there's political stuff going on. I mean, like crazy. It seems like the older guard is very cognizant of like, hey, I don't want to lose my spot. Yep. You guys are trying to push up the younger guys. Yep. And, and obviously Benoit, Malenko, Eddie and Saturn play a role in this because as we're leading into January, 
they become as as you're about to leave. I mean, they all are, are getting ready to leave. Obviously, they've they've had talks with Bruce Pritchard, possibly illegally. I don't want to say allegedly illegally uh, or whatever, however legal way you want to go around it. But they not really supposed to be. They're under contract WCW. All of a sudden, you know, two weeks later, whatever it is, they're in WWF. So obviously there was talks beforehand. You, you don't just go, oh, I'm out of here. And all of a sudden, land. No, nah, bro, I think they kind of did when I left. Like when, 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 bro, keep in mind, like I'm writing TV, I'm writing TV, I'm writing TV. These guys go to a TV. Russo is not there anymore. And Sullivan's in charge. Right. So they knew, like they knew, holy shit. And a lot of those guys, bro, for whatever reason, and I, you know, I, I wasn't there. A lot of them had heat with Kevin, you know, and a lot of them, you know, now that Kevin was back in charge, that that's when the phone calls were made. And that was like, like I said, bro, that first week when I was not there, I think they tried to put the belt on Benoit to make him happy. But those guys were like gone the next week. Ben was the story goes hands over the belt says I'm out of here I don't want to be champ then yeah. Dean Eddie and and Perry leave with them so you leave, lose all those guys who were huge huge yep. part of the show yep. then Bret Hart gets hurt with concussion yep. then Jeff Jarrett gets hurt with a concussion yep. then Goldberg slices his arm open from yep. punching his hand through a limo I mean yep. you literally lost seven guys which yep. is insane to think seven guys yep. in in a month and bro that's that's it still would have been okay. It, there were so many guys employed at, at WCW that it would not have been an issue. So like that, you know, yeah, bro, it, it was every, everybody was falling, bro. Everybody was getting hurt and everybody was falling, but um, I, we would have been fine. I, I mean, there, there were enough, there was enough depth at WCW that I don't think that would have affected our writing. So you go home for a few months and then come back. Were you always in talks with Brad about coming back? Never, never, bro. As, as bro, I swear to God, this is the truth. So we leave and it's a three point five. Every bro, every week the rating is going back down to a two point five. Okay, <laughs> so finally they get back to in three in three months we went from a two five to a three five. Three months without me there, they went back from a three five to a two five. So that's when Brad called because, bro, all I cared about, I swear to you, bro, I did not want to go back. All I cared about was I got a check every two weeks. That's all I cared about. I did not want to go back to work. I did not want to be in that environment. I was just every two weeks, bro, I am not shitting you. I was at that mailbox making sure that they were paying me. So uh, no, bro, there was not constant talk. It was after the three months, it was a call from Siegel that said, I want you to meet somebody at a this restaurant. I knew who, who, who he was talking about. Uh, there was no question in my mind. Bro, listen, you can't, you, you can't force people to just work together and think it's going to work. From day one, bro, Eric Bischoff and myself are two completely different animals. The, the first time I sat down with him, is it was at a restaurant in Atlanta that's no longer there called Hops. You got to understand something, bro. He's sitting across the guy that ultimately was partial, partially responsible for him losing his job at WCW because I was writing for the WWE when we turned the tide and then he got fired. And then on top of that, creatively, I was the guy hired to replace him. So Eric off the bat has every reason in the world not to like me. Every reason in the world, bro. Plus, he wants his old job back without a shadow of a doubt. Me, on the other hand, bro, the guy came across to me as arrogant, cocky, conceited, things that were important to Eric, money, power, they were not important to me. The, the thing that was always important to me, bro, was writing and producing the best show I possibly could. 
I didn't care about money. I didn't care about being the boss. I didn't care about people being afraid of me. I, I get in the trenches and I work. So from day one, bro, you had two personalities here that were never going to get along. It did seem like an odd pairing. Yeah, yeah, it's just we're 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 oil and water, bro. We're just two different people. Sometimes even sports, like they put guys together that oh, they were good here, they're good there. Let's put them together. It doesn't work, and then all of a sudden they play like a team, a cohesive team, like let's say WB was, where they had all the pieces in place. There's no way to beat them because they're an actual team against guys that are just playing on their own, basically. That's it, bro. Absolutely, yep. So with that, it almost ha- kind of had your idea of the Millionaires Club, where the, all the old guys are together, all the clinical rich guys they're they're together against the new blood, the you know the, the young guys, some of them not so young, but the younger guys, maybe the mid card guys, maybe the guys that thought they deserved the push, Scott Steiner, Booker T, Jeff Jarrett, like those kind of guys. Is that the structure that he wanted to, or is that kind of your your storyline? No, that was both of us, bro. We 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 met beforehand, him and I, and and we basically came up with that storyline and all that stuff together april 10th 2000s pretty memorable nitro i mean you, you, everybody hands over the title bischoff makes a funny remark to sid hand it over make sure you don't have scissors you know making little little jokes little shoot comments i guess you would say in in wrestling but did you think that was going to be something because everybody was interested in it everything was hot but that was almost like okay let's see if bischoff and russo can get along and for how long they can get along together Bro, listen, there were, you know, I mean, uh, you know, bro, he wanted his job back. And and, and I was in the way of that. Um, it, it wasn't going to work, bro. It, it just it just wasn't going to work. And the thing that really set me off, bro, here's what really set me off. Um, I was doing all the work. And Eric was sitting in the high office. You know, er Eric would be like the Tuesday morning quarterback. Whereas going into the show, he would like everything. And then all of a sudden, Tuesday, uh, I I don't know if it was based on internet or what, but all of a sudden on Tuesday, he didn't like this, he didn't like that, and he didn't like the other thing. Okay? So my whole thing is, bro, either get in the trenches and freaking work. Because you're you're not to to me you're not mightier than thou, okay, bro. I was the one that physically wrote the show. See, that's the thing. You you know, bro. A lot of people this this clowns one of them too. <laughs> they, they, they think creative is coming to a meeting for an hour and throwing ideas out there. That that's what they think creative. They have no idea, bro, what goes into writing a television show. This guy, Bischoff. They never wrote a television show, bro. I'm talking about from one minute to three hours. They never did that. They have no idea what it takes, bro. That is a lot of work. You've got to, you've got to write out every promo with bullet points, every commercial break, every hook, every music entry. You got it, bro. It's like, it's, it's like a, it's literally like a movie script every week. That's what I did. I did all that work, bro. So now, you know, I got this guy sitting up here. Oh, I didn't like this. I didn't like that. And I'm like, F this, bro. F this. And, bro, that's why this doesn't get talked a lot about. But I called Brad Siegel because I was so sick of working with Eric. And in this structure, I said, Brad, let Eric do creative. I'm done, bro. I'm done, bro. I even was talking to my lawyer at that point, bro. You need to get me out of this deal. No matter what it cost me, no matter what it cost me, I don't want to be in this deal. I, th- that That's the position I was in. So I said, Brad, put Eric in charge of creative. I- I'm done. I- I'm done, bro. I can't work like this. Brad held an emergency meeting, bro. He had me and Eric fly out to LA and it was the three of us in like some kind of a bus or a camper or something. And I basically said what I'm telling you now. I I basically said that in front of Eric. These are some of the reasons why Eric really hates me because I basically laid out to Brad, bro, let, let him write, let him write the creative, bro. If he thinks he could do it, let him do it. But bro, Brad was like, no, like that's not what I want. I want you to 
write the show. So it was kind of left like, okay, Vince, you're going to write the show on your own and Eric's going to stay out of it. That's how it was kind of left. Well, bro, that Sunday was Bash at the Beach. And from that point on, it was over. And we have a whole show, so I'm not going to get into bed, but we have a whole show, me and you, uh, on your YouTube, which is great. I had, I think it's like 45,000 views. Some, it's a really good amount of views, but yeah. anybody who hasn't seen it, definitely check that out. We go break that thing down into detail yeah. on Hogan's creative control and what was yeah. supposed to happen, all that kind bro, of stuff. There were two times. Eric despises me, bro, because that time with Siegel and there was one time with Dixie Carter where I called him out in front of Dixie. Bro, Eric does not like to be called out. Nobody calls out Eric, bro. Nobody. I guarantee you I was the only guy that did it, not once, but twice. That's why he has this hatred towards me. But bro, the reason why I did that is I, I'm not going to play politics. Let's get this all out in the open, man to man. I'll say what I want to say. You say what you want to say. Brad Siegel sitting right there. Dixie Carter sitting right there. So it's it's not behind anybody's back. It's all in the open. That's how I do business, bro. And and like I said, man, I did it once with Siegel at WCW. Then I did it with uh, Dixie, and and he that does not work well with him. I saw recently, which is very big of you. I saw recently Khan was kind of bad mouthing Bischoff, who knows work or shoot or whatever's going on there. But you said to, to, to think anything less of Bischoff or to discredit him in the business and think his opinion doesn't matter is silly. So I thought that was pretty big of you. Oh, you yeah, know, see, know? bro, that that's the thing. I don't have any animosity towards him. Like, bro, Eric, Eric has said over and over again he would never do, be on the same show as me. He would never lower himself. Bro, I've never talked that crap. What I've always said is bro we were two dip, two people with two totally different personalities that were never going to get along that that that's what i've said i never blamed anybody like he was a certain way i was a certain way we were never going to get along so bro i have zero zero animosity towards that guy today none zero so obviously bash to the beach happens you're kind of you're you end up staying bischoff goes who knows what really happened with hogan and bischoff as far as them thinking one thing and then suing and you know who knows what's going on in their head but you're still there i mean you're you're staying with wcw you try to do kind of almost like a realism angle with nash and goldberg and scott steiner saying like oh they're not following the script was that something where you wanted to make it seem like wrestling was like we're, we're making it real or what was the thought process in that that storyline the thought process, bro, is to to add a reality to the business. Bro, everybody knows it's a work. We right. know it's a work. Bro, the interesting elements is what's really going on backstage. What's really happening in the company? What's happening? The politics. That's the interesting part, bro. Especially WCW. <laughs> yeah. If, if that's what wrestling became today, guess what, bro? You may turn off the 500,000 people that watch Rampage on Friday night. You would have 5 million television viewers that weren't necessarily wrestling marks. Bro, you would have them addicted to this show. But you know why nobody does it, bro? It goes back to the wrestling bubble. No, no, brother. They, they want long matches. Bro, dwindling numbers don't show you that they don't want long matches. Bro, I just started reviewing the Attitude Era. Right. Bro, the matches are three, four, five minutes. Eight million people were watching that show. All of a sudden, matches have become 12, 15, 20 minutes, and you got a million and a half people watching Raw. Like what? What don't you understand? That is crazy to think that like longer match. I know some longer matches I, I've noticed can hold up, but most of them do not because you literally and I, and this happens all the time. AEW, if you look at the ratings, people know this fifteen minute match. They know who's going to win. It's so predictable. Yep. They turn it off. They come yep. back. Like yep. or you it, turn it bro. off and you may not come back. You know, attitude error. You could turn it off, put on WCW, but you almost, you're almost like I don't want to miss it. 
You know what I mean? Like, oh shit, the Godfather. You know what I mean? You don't want to miss no, that. No, it's there. The data is there for them. It is there for them. But they don't, they're such marks, bro, that they want to do it their way. And you know, like, you know, bro, you got to think differently when it comes to AEW because you got to understand money doesn't matter. So whether Tony Khan, whose dad is a billionaire, makes or loses money doesn't matter. You got to take that out of the equation. So if Tony Khan, who is a mark, can have all these action figures and be booker of the year and write, that's all he wants. I mean, that's all he wants. But meanwhile, you know, people like me are sitting here saying, bro, you can quadruple your audience. If you just did this the right way, but and it's funny. Somebody on cash trading the marks. I forget who it was. One of the guys was saying, Oh, AEW is profitable. According to Tony Khan himself, two months ago into fourth said they're not profitable. They're in the right. red. So right. you can't just be a wrestling quote unquote journalist and say that the company's profitable. When the company owner who you think is being hundred percent honest, because it's a negative on the company says they're right. not profitable. Right. So they got to get their shit together over there, but obviously he's not profitable right now. He's in right. the red. Right. And and he's going to keep adding more talent and more talent. And, bro, here's one of my predictions, too. You know, bro, I collect albums. I have about 4,000 albums, okay? Love, my, yes. my, yeah, my wife tells me I don't need any more albums. And my wife has this idea, okay, for every album you buy now, you're going to get rid of one. And I'm like, no, I ain't getting rid of nothing. I collect albums. I'm not getting rid of any of these. The number's going to grow. Bro, Tony Khan collects wrestlers. He's not going to release anybody, bro. He's going to collect more action figures and more wrestlers and more wrestlers. And that that payroll is going to go up, 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 up. But it's not about making money. Bro, with, with Dixie Carter... The Carters had money, but were not billionaires, bro. So we were always faced with a budget. You know, money came into play a lot with TNA. That doesn't matter here. So it, it's really hard to look at, you know, apples to apples when it doesn't matter if they make money or not. Yeah. Did WCW have a budget or were you, that wasn't your department either? Like you weren't concerned with that? No, I was not concerned with that, no. Did you get to pick and choose who was coming in? Like when Lance Storm comes in, did you say I want Lance Storm, or you do, you weren't a part of that either? You weren't a part of talent relations. No, if 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 I if I wanted to bring somebody in, I would talk to JJ Dillon. I, I mean, I would talk to JJ Dillon. You know, if if other people, you know, on the committee, Disco or whatever, we wanted to bring somebody in, I would go to JJ and I'd say, JJ, we're interested in so and so, but never. Okay, we want them for three years. For the, ne None of that was ever discussed. Just we were interested in the talent. What was the relationship like with JJ? Because obviously he's Flair's really good friend. I well, mean, that's what happened. Hard, he's part of the old guard. That's what happened, bro. JJ was in the middle of all of that. Flair in JJ's ear. JJ in Bill Bush's ear. Um, yeah, so he he was one of those people. You know, bro, Sullivan was too. I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Bro, you know when... Player's boy. Yeah, you know, bro, when... You, bro, you know when you're, you're someplace and all of a sudden you look over here and two people are having a conversation. As soon as they see you looking at them, they stop talking. That, that's yeah. what it was. Like, I knew. So it was Sullivan. It was uh, J.J. Dillon. It was Ric Flair. Bro, I knew. Like, I knew what was going on. But, bro, my mentality was, I swear to God, my mentality was, bro, I'm not going to play politics. So go ahead and replace me, and we'll see what happens. I, I mean, seriously, because I knew, I knew what would happen. And exactly what I thought would happen did happen. And, you know, that's why three months later they wound up calling me back. And eventually you do win the WCW, like we said at the top, WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Yes. Now, the puppet, the disco man, he says that you did that because you were a mark for yourself He's and you wanted, an to be, you wanted to be such champion. An, he's such an idiot. Is that true? Is that uh, true? Bro, bro, you know what people don't understand? And 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 I have proof to this. Bro, if you put on AEW, if you put on Raw, it's the same shit every 
week. Right. Wrestlers want to fight each other because they're wrestlers. <laughs> That's why they I mean, bro, some of the storylines in the WWE the last couple of weeks were, okay, uh, the three guys wanted to be the face of WWE, uh, WWE so they got to fight all over that. Then, then they came out actually one week, and they were all reading their resumes. Bro, WWE is guys want to fight because they're wrestlers, okay? Bro, when you're writers, here's the thing. Number one, I never wanted to repeat what a wrestling fan had already seen. So we were constantly, constantly, constantly thinking of new looks, new stories, new ideas, stuff you hadn't seen before, okay? So, bro, when you create a scenario of Vince Russo has a match against Booker T, almost gets killed by Goldberg, but in the process is the first one to leave the cage, when you write something like that, bro, that wasn't supposed to happen, all of a sudden, what that does is it opens up the creative envelope because now, bro, you have you have all these opportunities for storylines that would not have been available prior. So that's why you that's why David Arquette becomes a champion. That's why Russo wins the belt because creatively, bro. Because these things weren't supposed to happen, bro, now you've got five, six, seven, ten different directions you could go in that you never had before. The only the only people that would truly understand that, bro, are writers. If you're a writer and you're writing a hundred and what was it, 50, 116 shows a year you would understand why you have moments like that. So he's wrong. You didn't just want to have he, a picture he, with he, the belt he, and everything he knows, else. He, he knows <laughs> that he's wrong. He's an idiot, bro. I think he said you wrote yourself to be champion because you wanted to have a picture with the belt and you always wanted to be the champion because you were always First of all, bro, let me tell you a couple of things. Number one, I couldn't even tell you what that belt looks like, number one. Number two, I, the, the, I don't even think there ever was a picture of the belt. But, bro, here, here's the thing that makes me crack up more than anything. So I, I almost get killed in winning the belt because Goldberg spears me out of the cage. That yep. was a nitro. Yep. Bro, the very next thunder, I relinquish the belt. Th that's what we're talking about here, bro. Yeah. The very next show, I give up the belt. Vince Russo did not have a title uh, uh, reign. <laughs> the very <laughs> next show, because, bro, the bottom line was, I should have never won, okay? I almost got killed in the process. Now that all of a sudden I have this thing, bro, I don't want this thing. That's why the very next show I did the all, I, I got nothing to prove. Like I, I kicked Booker's ass. I'm, <laughs> that's why I did that. But bro, the fact that people still make an issue out of it when it was from one show to the next. Oh, they go crazy about it. Yeah, they, crazy, they go nuts. Bro. It's, it's ridiculous, bro. Did you get a concussion from that spear and hitting your head on the outside? Oh, God, big time. That that Bro, I had many concussions leading up to that. That was the one that ended it. Like that one, I, it, I was done. I, after that one, I, I, that, I, that's when I went home. I, I was finished physically, bro. I had, um, um, whatchamacallit, um, vertigo horrible horrible that bouts of vertigo i had post concussion syndrome and that was the final nail did you say anything to goldberg like hey man i'm not a really wrestler that was a bit stiff or uh, bro, during the day i already had a concussion i was wrestling with a concussion and i told him that i'm like bro i'm concussed you gotta take care of me and like bro I'm, i'll never forget there were two you know, metal barri barricades. And I'm like, bro, you got to land me right between these, right between the, oh yeah, Vince, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. Bro, he drilled me right into the barricade, you know, and that, that was it, bro. That I was done at that point. 
So what was the like the final straw to leaving WWE for good? I guess it would be somewhere towards October of 2000. What was like the end game there, or basically maybe November? But bro, what, the, what was the final straw? The final straw really was, bro. I'll be honest with you. I was still writing the best show I could. I, I was still giving it my all, bro, giving the same effort, like through it all. But all of a sudden, bro, you'd show up for work and all everybody was talking about was the sale of the company. Nobody even cared about the show anymore. Like it didn't even matter. It was all about, oh, we're going to be sold. Who are we going to be sold? Who's going to buy? So is Eric going to? Every time you went to TV, that's all it was. So I said to myself, why am I going to put any more effort into this show when nobody gives a shit about the show? And that's when I was like, you know what, bro? Between my concussions and the doctor telling me I don't need any more stress with the head trauma, I'm I'm just, I'm done. And that was it, bro. That's when I went home. Were you working under a committee at that point too? Was it a bunch of guys? Was it you, Ed? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I I was the guy, but like I had put a committee together and we were working together. Yes. Who else was in it? Was it Bill Banks? Uh, Bill Banks, I think I, Borash was in there early. I brought Jeremy in. Uh, Ed was there. Disco was there. Terry Taylor was there. Um, uh, that's that's the gist of it, I think. Would you ever call Bill Banks your assistant, like Tony Khan did to QT Marshall? Never, bro. I, I, I <laughs> never, never. Bro, I were I, I, bro. Listen, I, I kind of broke Bill Banks in. I broke Jeremy in, and Jeremy's doing great things today. Oh yeah. I broke in uh, at, at TNA, Matt Conway. I always took the young guy under my wing. Bro, never in a million years would have referred to those guys as my assistant. Ever, ever, ever. So you leave WCW, obviously, then Bischoff and Johnny Ace are kind of in control. Terry Taylor's writing some of the shows. You see that they get sold to WWF. What were your like initial thoughts? Like, oh, I knew it was going to happen or just complete shock? Bro, I want my money. I, I, I don't care at that point. Like, I swear to God, I am so done with this. I don't care. I don't want to go work for the WWE. I want to be done with this. I just wanted to make sure I got my two years pay. That's all I cared about, bro. Interesting to note this. Stu Snyder worked for WBF for only a small window. Brad Siegel's college roommate and best friend. They in that small window, maybe, you know, maybe I'm crazy. Conspiracy theory, maybe. In that small window, they get that sale done for four million when Bischoff offered sixty five million. Something could be, and then Stu Snyder's gone after WWF makes the. Oh, is that Something, is that how much Bischoff offered? Yeah, they had sixty five million was up. Wow, I, I never knew that, bro. That that's that's ridiculous. But bro. that's with TV, and they're going to be on TBS and TNT. But they the, they didn't want to be on TV, right? Right. Jamie right. Kellner said no more TV, which Jamie Kellner looks like an idiot. Imagine if you went to like your boss, like we can have a $65 million offer or a $4 million offer. And you take the $4 million. Offer, yeah. Especially, he, especially like 65. Okay. Give him the TV. Like, yeah. like yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I never knew it was that amount, bro. Never knew. Crazy. Yeah. And he had his whole group together, Bischoff. I mean, yeah. he, he had a team together and the guy was used to it. He did the ESPN classic. He built when they were, bro. I'll, I'll tell you this up. right now. And this, this, bro, like I said, this show, this, I don't have any heat with Eric, bro. I'll tell you right now, without a doubt. I, I say this without a doubt. If Eric were Tony Khan, I think those ratings right now would be doubled with, without a shadow of a doubt. If Eric were running that company instead of Khan, I think they would have twice the number of people watching that show today. I really, I really believe that, bro. I honestly believe that. I wouldn't mind if Bischoff went on their TV now and, and said what he's saying on his podcast and just was a character <laughs> because it's yeah. true. Like a lot of the stuff that he's saying is great. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Could you see that maybe? Is that in the works? Bro, they don't get the joke, man. They don't, they, 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 they don't. Bro, that, that generation and the Tony Khans of the world, they're so super sensitive like they don't understand you can create this through 
you know, shoot promos and reality, but you're professional enough to work together. They, they, they don't get that concept. It's like, if you talk about us, you're the enemy. You're an idiot, bro. Can you imagine if they had me on there cutting a promo? Like you're an you're an idiot. You can work together, bro. You don't need to get your feelings hurt because of what Eric Bischoff is saying or what Vince Russo is saying. It is a business, but bro, this generation today, if if you're not putting them over, you're the freaking enemy, bro, and they will do everything they can to publicly bury you, and that's that's freaking ridiculous, bro. Yeah, just imagine you. Let's say you had a, a heel stable, like almost like Dan Lambert, like you had a heel stable. I mean, the heat that you would get. Oh my god, would you be open to it? Ah, uh, bro, like, bro, I, I got to be honest with you. Like, for me, like, I really believe, like, traveling is over. Like, I don't know what it would take, man, to get me out of the house on a weekly basis. I don't think there's enough money. I, I swear to God, John, John, if somebody said, be a character on the show for a million dollars, just show up at TV, I would not do that. I wow. just, just the traveling, bro, obviously in the world that we live in, I'm just, I'm, I I can't, I can't put myself through that again. Bro, the politics have not changed. And, you know, it's one thing, bro, when you're in your 30s. Bro, it's 60 years old. I'm not going to deal with that at, at this point in my life. Like, I, all the money in the world, I just, I would not be. Now, I've talked about, what would I consult? Bro, if I could do stuff sitting right here. You want me to write, you want me to watch your show and critique your show and throw you some ideas. Maybe you want to give me a Bray Wyatt. Vince, what do we do with this guy? Bro, that's fine. I'll do that from here. But to get back in that system, bro, never, ever, ever in a million years, bro. With the WCW time, what do you look back at anything fondly? Like maybe just the paycheck or yeah, leaving, that, leaving, leaving, leaving. Bro, seriously, the day my contract ended was the happiest, happiest day in my life. Bro, you know, the funny thing was they wanted me to sign a three-year contract. And I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm out of here in two years. Cause at that time I, I was kind of done with the business. So I said, no, bro, two years, that's all I'm signing. But they actually wanted me to sign for three years, bro. I don't even regret leaving that money on the table because I was, I was so happy, bro. When that part of my life came to an end. Seems like a few good things did pop up like Booker T becoming a star, Scott Steiner becoming a star. I mean, there's a few obviously bright spots, but overall you would say, eh, bro, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you two things that came out of that. Honestly, for me, two things, no doubt in my mind, the proudest moment uh, of my wrestling career was Booker T becoming the champion because bro, at the end of the day, I was personally sued for that. I've never been sued in my life, bro. I've never ever been in that kind of trouble. Hulk Hogan sued me for defamation of character. And that all stemmed back to me not putting the belt on him. And I, I, I stood my ground because the right thing to do was to put the belt on Booker I got sued. I had to go through depositions. It was a living hell. I would not have traded that moment in for the world. That is my proudest, proudest achievement, hands down. And I say the second thing, bro, honestly, believe it or not, was meeting this idiot. Uh, my <laughs> Glenn Gilberti, bro, is the, the f aside from the wrestling business, the truest guy I've ever met in my life. Bro, this guy does not have one political bone in his body. Glenn's not, okay, bro, I'll be your friend as long as you could do something for me. But the minute you can, I, I got a thousand people like that. The minute Glenn was, has been a true, true friend, bro, literally since 1999. Uh, bro, he stopped. Uh, he he stopped on the brand recently because he needed a hiatus. 
I'm totally cool with that because I want Glenn to be happy. Like that's how much Glenn needs to me. When Glenn says, Vince, I need a break, I'm not going to think about the brand first and this and that. I'm thinking about Glenn and, and like, the, the, he, he's bro. He's the most truest guy in the business that you ev- ever will meet. So I, I think those two things were the two positives that came out of that. Nice. Good stuff, Vince. Thank you. That's head towards uh, the plugs. What do you got as far as what you got coming up? Yeah, bro. I started a lot of new shows on a uh, Russo's brand.com and patreon.com forward slash Russo TWC. Uh, Al snow took a, uh, Glenn's place on Lions, Tigers, Bears, and Head. He had his first show last week. He was phenomenal, bro. I also started breaking down the Attitude Era hour by hour because, bro, I really didn't want to do it, but so many people want that. So it's not a watch along. I'm actually watching the shows an hour at a time and breaking them down. Um, Over on Patreon, bro, EC3 has just joined us, which is great. And I'm going to do a series called uh, Vince versus Vince, where I'm going to go through our history and I am going to end it with our final email exchange that took place about two weeks ago. I'm going to talk about that. It's, it's therapy for me. It's closure for me. And that's going to be exclusively on patreon.com forward slash Russo TWC. Great stuff. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website, tmptempire.com and Patreon, patreon.com slash tmptempire. Vince, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. As always, appreciate it, man.